Okay, so earlier we talked about decision tree. Next, we're going to look at Bayes um, classification methods. So Bayesian classification methods, it has a solid foundation on, um, on Bayes theorem. And today we're going to first learn naive Bayesian classifier. And um, I think next week we're going to look at um, Bayesian network. Um, so um, this um, a naive Bayesian classifier has long been used as a benchmark. Um, it's very, very simple. Um, actually, the model does not need to be constructed. The data itself is the model that you can just uh, quickly classify new examples without constructing a model. Um, so, um, and I know many earlier um, uh, uh, web search engines used naive Bayesian classifying tags. So it's, it's, a, um, it's um, a widely used um, classif classification algorithm, even though some of the assumptions is actually not, is not met in the practice. Um, so a naive Bayesian um, classifier. Um, so in this scenario, as before, we have D, um, which is um, a labeled set of tuples and as their associated class label. Um, each um, observation is represented by uh, an attribute vector. So here we have n attributes. So each every x is a value to a specific attribute that describe one observation. And suppose those observations belongs to m different classes. So we have those classes. Um, in naive Bayesian classification is derived um, um, by computing the maximum posterior probability, which is given x, given this observation, what's the probability for this observation to belong to class CI? Um, probability of CI is the prior probability of um, how many times class I occurred in the training example. Um, so from the base, base theorem, we know that this value, this posterior probability is equals to this. Um, because for a fixed data set, um, the probability of every X occurred is um, fixed. So we can ignore this because our goal is just to find the greatest value for a class. We're comparing the value of this term to find which class has the, the greatest um, posterior probability for observation. So then we are left um, only with those um, two um, things and we know how to estimate this. Um, we can use number of class, um, number of observations belongs to class I divided into total number of um, observations. That's our PCI, um, the prior um, probability for class I. Now we need to figure out how to find this. Um, in order to do that, we um, I have a uh, sorry question on the, sure. the previous slide, mm -hmm. where um, the the p of x x is a, a single observation. Yes, correct. So as p of x means, let's say I have. 100 observation, then probability of x is 1 by 100.1, or does it mean something else? Uh, sorry, what was the question? So p of x, I, I know what you're talking about p of x. Your example, your concrete example was? Was that, uh, I, I'm trying, I was uh, wondering whether uh, if x is a single observation, Yes. Then it is. is P of X simply uh, one upon the number of observations? Is that mean, let's say we have a hundred observations, that means P of X is one percent. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You can you can think of that way, but really this 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 um, this factor make no difference at all in in this um, in naive Bayesian classification because our goal is to compare because the probability for x occur no matter which class um it's fixed the probability this is the prior probability for x to occur right 
this is fixed in, um, uh, independent of um, any of those classes. So because our goal is to um, predict, to compare which of this value is greater among all the classes. Therefore, we can't ignore this. I, I was just maybe wondering, and maybe it's oversimplifying, oh, yes. why yes. instead of P of X, why did they not just use N, divide by N, which is a constant which we can take out? Is it because that there's uh, some difference, like instead of just divide by N? Because Bayesian, Bayes theorem says so. So Bayes theorem is basically conditional probability theory. Um, this is joint probability. So this is a joint probability of, this is one way of writing joint probability of C and X corpus. If you move P of X to this side, this is another way of saying the same thing. Therefore, you have this equation. In order to find this, this has to be moved. P of X has to be moved down here um, as a denominator, right? It has to be P of X. Only in this case, we can simplify the problem by ignoring it. Because we only need to find for, for this observation, should um, P, C, I conditioned on X greater than P, C, 2 um, conditioned on X, which one is greater? If C sub I sub one is greater than we believe X belongs to class one. If C of two is greater than we belong, we think X belongs to um, C sub two class. Um, so now our question has been reduced to compute this term. Um, how do we do that? Uh, it's a very, very challenging. But if we apply a conditional independent uh, assumption, um, then it becomes really simple. This conditional independent assumption is if we know class, if we know this class, then um, all the attributes are independent of each other. Um, so, um, you know, when I was first learning about conditional independence, I found this concept really hard to understand. Something could initially to be dependent. Once you add a piece of information, that thing suddenly becomes independent. Um, so I searched for examples, you know, under what situation that could occur. Um, I found a good example that's easy to understand. Um, think about children, um, children's height and their vocabulary size is not independent. They're dependent. You can see taller um, kids probably know more um, vocabulary. Like my daughter, she's in college. She's taller than my son. She definitely knows a lot more vocabulary than, than my 10 years old. However, if we add another piece of information, if we know the age, you know, among to, when, among kids who are 10 years old, their height and their vocabulary probably are not that dependent anymore. Um, so that's how I started to understand um, conditional independence. So here we say within this class, the attributes, um, um, exam, um, different attributes um, are not dependent. If we, with that assumption, we can actually simplify this joint probability to a simple product of all individual attributes that are involved in this observation. So this gave us this formula. Okay. Um, so we only need to count um, class di distribution. We only to, need to count for this class how many um, observations has this value for this attribute. So that will give this, um, give the values for each every um, uh, factors that we have in this um, equation. Um, now to estimate this probability, um, I just to give 
a one way if a is categorical counting how many times xi um, a a equals xi but if certain attribute is continuous value then what do we do uh, one thing we can do is to assume this attribute values are normally distributed then within um, one class we can compute um, their um, uh, Gaussian probability that gave us um, the probability of giving this class what's the probability for a to take the value of x right so we can for this class we can compute the class average and standard deviation and using this formula we can find the probability which is one of the term here questions okay um, so this is one example that we can um, using again the computer buying data set um, to illustrate naive Bayes, uh, naive um, base classifier. So we have by computer yes, um, not by computer no. This is our model. We um, and then the data to be classified is this instance. If age um, smaller than 30 years old, income is medium, student yes, credit rating fair will this instance be classified as by or not by? Um, so first, um, using the, because we know we need to compute this value here. Um, therefore, we need to first to compute the prior uh, probability for CI. We have two classes, yes and no. And we have 14 instances, yes and no cases. We have a good estimate of the probability for um, the, the class prior. Um, distribution. Um, then we compute the second term. Um, for each class, for yes class, we compute, um, because our example is H um, is smaller, uh, all those um, attribute combinations, we end up need to have all those values, right? Um, yes and X. X covers all those one, two, three, four attributes. So individually, we compute their conditional probability. And then we put them together. Um, so for yes, buying and X. So yes, we take out this. Yes, take out this. Another yes, take out that. Another yes, take out this. And this gave us um, the probability for um, um, if if somebody is buying the computer, what's the probability for us to observe this um, um, example or observation? So once we found that, and this for the no class, we can actually compute this. Compare this two, we see that the first value is greater. Therefore, we classify this instance as a computer buyer. By computer equals yes. Questions? Okay. Um, so there is a little so, problem. Uh, yes. Could we look at, so in this case, so we uh, the example that you have age less than equal thirty, income medium, student yes, credit rating fair. We're basing it on that probability and sort of multiplying it, assuming they're independent events. Yes. Um, is this similar to what one does for the like the chi square, those contingency tables? To or am I overthinking that? Mm. Right, in chi-square contingency table, we compute our, there is definitely similarity, we compute the expected value by applying this independence assumption. That's okay. how we get to the expected value. Then we can see how far away the observed value is to the expected value. Um, so naive Bayesian has has one little um, thing is as we can see the this score is a product of many elements. Any of the elements taking a value of zero will result in the final probability of being zero. Um, this would occur when the training example does not cover something that's in a new example. So assuming that we have in our um, uh, training data set, we have a thousand tuples. 
we have high and medium income, but we don't have low. Um, yet our um, new example that need to be classified actually have um, somebody who's low income. Then we will not be able to estimate um, this, um, this um, conditional uh, probability element for, for this um, classification task because um, the, the prior, um, the income for this class low uh, for buying or not buying this income is actually zero. So they, it will create zero uh, uh, values in this, um, in some terms in this equation. In order to avoid this problem, we can use um, Laplacian correction, um, also called Laplace, Laplace um, estimator. Idea is very, very simple, just to add one. We just need to, we need to have a very small probability value to, to make sure this term is not zero. So because we have income have three levels, we need to add um, to the denominator denominator three. So add up, they add up together to be one. So this is a way to avoid um, having zero probability computation in um, naive Bayesian. Questions? So is that a case where, um, like to use an example, like if we were in the previous thing, um, suppose we got a, um, a credit rating that is right now we see fair and excellent. So suppose we got a credit rating of unknown, then we don't yeah. know it. So yeah. okay, exactly. Yeah, right. That's a good observation. It could also occur when we do um, ten cross validation. The sample, the training split, it does not have certain thing represented in the test split. You will not be able to correctly estimate your uh, model performance. Um, in those scenario too. Um, so this um, Laplacian correction, although very simple, but it's, to it's totally useful. So if we have this after the Laplacian correction, how does it decide what class the, that, uh, for example, here low income is because it doesn't have any samples to train on? Right, exactly. So it, it will end up to be have a very, very, so we're assuming, we're assuming, so <laughs> this is a good assumption, right? Because I think in any case, um, any rare uh, event would happen. It will only happen with a very, very low probability. So this adding one meant to model this real scenario in any um, type of situation anything that has not been observed, probably going to have a very, very low probability. A very simple, we could go out our way to, to build another model to estimate this probability, but we could also use the simple Laplacian correction to just plug in one um, to solve this problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I, this makes sense, but how do you estimate what class that one should belong to or when, when we encounter it, how do we classify this? It's again, following the exactly the same thing. But we you don't only, have a sample to use to decide where- We to don't, in, yes. Right? We don't have a sample to estimate. Therefore, we just put a very, very small number there. So we do say, we, we assume that- Yeah, we assume it has a very low- to both classes? Right, so if, if buy, buying this has 1,000 tuples, let's say not buying has 100 tuples, then the condition, prob conditional probability of, of income equals low, buy equals not, would be one, one over 103. That will give us all the information we need to compute this, to decide. I understand, um, your question is, we don't have training example to estimate this. This is why we, we give a fixed low probability to solve this problem. Once we have uh, this given low probability that um, 
then we can follow exactly the same steps to predict, to see which class this um, low uh, attribute is more likely to happen. So in this case, um, the, um, so we have a thousand tuples uh, total, but uh, we think by has 1000 tuples. Oh, Sorry. by has 1000 yeah. tuples. Okay, and then uh, not by has, uh, so, so by with 1000 tuples, 990, sorry, I'm confused. How many are like in the uh, computer by a yes versus no, like the, the predicted class, what is the size of each? Um, sorry, I changed, I changed from our previous example to illustrate this idea um, of being a very small um, probability. In this, in this example, we can say that buying has 1,000 1, tuples. Most people are going to buy a computer. Um, not buying 100 tuples. Okay, so buy is 1,000, 1, not buy is 100. So then um, in this new tuple, like, uh, I guess I got confused of how the denominator becomes 1,003. Um, it's 100, and sorry, because as you can see, all those three adds together need to be one. Oh, so we add not one just to the, like, we, it's not like we now have 1,001 tuples. We have 1,003 tuples because- Exactly, yes because every one of them added one. Originally, low income was is yes, medium is 990 and high is 10. So one is added to each of them. Yes. Because it, it would not be fair to just to add one to low. We add one to all of them, and that make our denominators increased by three. But we make sure this scheme will give us all those three probability adding up together. See, this um, is the total buying um, probability, no matter what income is. This three thing adds up to be one. So we still have a probability distribution. So in another way, another way of looking at it, in order to give a low probability, this schema allows us to give a very low probability to this unobserved value while still keeping a probability distribution for this class, for, for um, this conditional distribution. And what about for the no, like right now it says by is equal to yes. So do we do the same thing for by equal to no? Like yes. Just... Okay, if, so, if, sorry. Right. If, if in the no group, um, we still don't have low income, maybe in the no buying group, we have in low income. In that case, we don't need to do anything. Okay, so if it's already there in the, like the opposite class, like if this is, let's say the right. first class is buy, it's right. not here, then we add it for each income level. But then if it's there in the other class, we don't have to do um, anything. But if it's not there in the other class, we have to repeat the same thing in the other class and add it. Exactly, for yes. For that as well? Okay. Yes. Um, and I see, I see. Now, um, what is the, uh, like, you know, in, um, in earlier in the semester when you talked about missing data, you said one of the options is, um, so like, sorry, let me backtrack. So in this case, let's say this um, is a new row with new data that we didn't have before. What about if we built a model that excluded income and predicted based on that decision tree, is that better or is it better to do this in terms of the quality of result? Can you see that again, sorry. So suppose we have, you know, um, like in the previous uh, example with the computer buyers, mm -hmm. we had uh, one, two, three, three, four, four attributes that were used to predict um, mm -hmm. the computer buyer. Yeah. 
So assuming in this data set also we had four attributes and income is one of those four attributes. Mm -hmm. Now, the, I guess the, the question, so I was wondering that in practice, which is better? Should we use a model that um, only uses three attributes without the income? Or oh, should... oh, oh. Um, no, I will definitely, this, um, the zero probability problem will not in effect hurt the performance that greatly. I will not, um, because of lacking certain um, values to, uh, purely based on this to choose a different model. No. In, in, uh, I, what I hear you saying that since income does not give us complete information, we cannot reliably using the training example to estimate its distribution. Maybe we should just drop income completely. So, well, I, I, sorry, I guess I was not clear. I was thinking like whether we should, um, let's say there's a um, certain number of data points, if they are significant. Uh, one option is of course to throw away the data point, right? As you said, when you have missing data, one option is just throw away the data point saying, okay, this data point is no value or just weird um, outlier, throw it away. Mm -hmm. I guess the other option then is, uh, one is of course this option. And then perhaps a third option is, as you were saying, to build two separate models. In one model, we are looking at those uh, data points that have uh, just uh, high and um, medium. And then in another model, we, look at the ones that, uh, you know, where essentially where we build a separate model that does uh, to handle these uh, outliers or some small number of, because I'm assuming this new value is an outlier, new, new observation of an outlier of some sort. Uh, I, I don't think so. This, I, I, I'm not sure this is a missing that I, um, it's missing observation. It's not certain observation has a piece of data that's missing. It, it's more like missing an entire ob observation or training data being incomplete. But in, in a lot of data mining, um, well, data mining applications probably is less severe, like you don't have enough training examples. Most likely you have lots of training examples. But in general, in machine learning algorithm, you know, most of the problem, we do not have enough training example. Um, recall we talked about the, the curse of dimensionality. When you have lots of attributes, then you need different combinations of those attribute values to, in order to learn a phenomena. Um, this is example when you don't have enough training example to model certain, um, you don't have enough training data per uh, attributes to learn um, or model a, a phenomenon. This problem occurs for, for almost every, I mean, it's a common problem. It's not specific to, to naive Bayesian classifier, only because we have to compute this conditional probability. Um, this becomes an issue that can be easily solved using Laplacian. Um, maybe we can discuss more on this later. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So we can actually, yeah. Um, <clears throat> So this classifier, um, naive, um, base, uh, naive, Bayesian, naive base classifier, naive Bayesian classifier, I use those terms exchangeably, sorry about that, um, if that's confusing to you, um, but you know what I meant, it's the same thing. Um, so the algorithm obviously is very, very simple to implement. Um, you actually don't need to actually build the model, you just, you just need to keep on adding your training examples. Um, um, the prediction may um, change or improve. Um, the disadvantage, the, the huge, the major thing is the um, class conditional independence. Um, uh, lots of applications that use na naive Bayes does not meet this assumption, but they also 
even when they don't meet the assumption, they often give very good results. So nobody cares about this conditional independence assumption anymore. Nobody checks it. We just use it and see how it performs. Um, so the dependencies obviously exist among those variables, even when class is known, because class label is all given, right? You can you can you can provide whatever class label that you want. Um, that really doesn't add any information. It's not the age um, that adds um, that uh, remove the dependency between children's height and their vocabulary. Um, and so there are other ways to address this. Um, we're going to look at a Bayesian belief network um, in the next chapter that actually models precisely um, the dependencies. Um, however, even in those uh, um, Bayesian belief networks, the we also need other assumptions to simplify the computation. Um, only the dependencies, um, the assumption is less severe. I mean, it's less strong. So in this case, the reason we would not do like a PCA to uh, you know get things that are independent is that because um, if we do that the um, attributes don't have the meaning that we can interpret the model with right that's one that's one of the major things and also really um, because even when you don't have those um, um, assumptions. I mean, even if the assumption is violated, you still get good performance. Then why do I have to spend that effort to construct other models if we end up to be having a, a good, useful model? Um, naive Bayesian classifier before support vector machines is one of the dominant text classification algorithm. It's routinely performed at 85% and above um, accuracy, precision, and recall. Um, so for practical purposes, those are good enough. That's why it's very popular at that time. And, and then support vector machine was invented. And then people realized support vector machine gives much better performance. And, and it did. Support vector machine then becomes the predominant algorithms for text classification and many other classification problems. And it's still very, very useful, even with um, um, deep um, neural network. Uh, when you don't have enough data set training examples, like support vector machines, other methods are still very, very useful.